Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Executive Vice President of Communications and Public Affairs for American Trucking Associations and publisher for Transport Topics, Sue Hensley. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us here on this final day of MCNE. I want to welcome you to this morning's general session. Our focus today will be on autonomous and platooning technologies that seem to be in the news more and more these days. Not long ago, this discussion may have seemed more suited for a science fiction conference than here at ATA, but several high-profile demonstrations and the emergence of several new players have started opening new possibilities. Transport Topics has been there from the beginning, providing coverage of an issue that some believe may forever change trucking. Before we get started, I want to recognize the sponsors for this morning's session, Freightliner Trucks and Omnitrax. Thank you. We greatly appreciate your support. Now let me introduce the panelists. First today joining us is Jack Roberts, a trucking journalist and lead author of a platooning report just released by the North American Council on Freight Efficiency. Thank you, Jack. Next up is Josh Swickkiss, co-founder and president of Peloton Technology. Also joining us today is Sean Waters, director of compliance and regulatory affairs with Daimler Trucks North America. And we're thrilled to have Anthony Lewandowski, co-founder of Auto. <laughs> Finally joining us is Jude Huron, administrator of the Management Serv and Services and Programs Division of the Nevada DMV. Our moderator for this morning's session is Neil Apt, editorial director for Transport Topics. And Neil, I'm going to turn things over to you for what I know is going to be an interesting and lively discussion. So, thank you. Thank you, Sue. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for getting up early to be with us. I'm in the unique position of being the intermission act between the Rolling Stones, who played the Freightliner dinner last night, and John Fogarty, who will be at tonight's banquet. I hope today's discussion will be as exciting. As Sue mentioned, there is a lot of interest surrounding these technologies. But there are, there are also many questions and a healthy dose of, skept of skepticism. Over the next 90 minutes, we hope to provide you a better understanding of the technologies, predict how they will develop, and discuss what it will mean for your future. I encourage you to write your questions on the cards that were put on the seat before you came in. You can pass them to some of the TT staff that's walking around. I promise we will get to them a little bit later. OK, I now want to turn to Jack. He is filling in for Mike Roth, who is not able to attend due to a family illness. Our thoughts are with him during this difficult time. Jack, thank you for joining us. Can you walk us through some of the findings from the report that was released last week? Sure. <clears throat> thank you, Neil. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, Thanks for coming. Uh, first off, uh, I want to say that uh, as a trucking journalist, all of our thoughts are with Mike Roth, and our thoughts are also with Suzanne Stepinski. I know many of you know her. Um, our thoughts are with them both. They're having family illnesses now. I want to take a minute and thank uh, Freightliner for the uh, show last night. I've been a Rolling Stones fan since I saw them on their infamous Saturday Night Live special back in 1978, and I have to say that Keith actually looked better last night than he did in 1978. So, uh, that was really cool for Freightliner to do that, but I have to say that all of the OEMs and tier one suppliers in this industry are so, so generous and kind to me and my fellow trucking journalists. Um, it's, it can be overwhelming at times. It's just one of the many testaments how, to how great an industry we actually uh, write about and report on. So um, I'm going to go over a confidence report that uh, the North American Council for Freight Efficiency just issued on truck platooning. I was the lead author on that report. And I'm also a history buff. And so I'm going to start this little, uh, my little bit here in the beginning by uh, talking about the Daytona 500 in the year 1960. And Junior Johnson, a stock car pioneer, had a problem. He was running uh, 1960 Chevys, not particularly aerodynamic vehicles. 
uh, had a 409 Chevrolet engine under the hood. That was initially a truck engine. And he wasn't able to keep up with the Pontiacs running the track in the test runs. Pontiac had a high output engine that year, and Pontiac had about 22 miles per hour on Junior. And his team kept working on the car, working on the car, couldn't come up with any options. But Junior noticed on, the tr on uh, practice runs that when the Pontiacs blew by him, if he pulled in behind them, he picked up a little speed. And so when the race began, you know, a lot of innovation often comes out of sheer desperation. Junior really had no options, and so uh, in sheer desperation, Junior tucked in behind the Pontiacs for the duration of the race, and he found that he was, A, not only able to keep pace with the Pontiacs and stay in a lead position, uh, he used a lot less fuel than the Pontiacs did. He didn't pit as often, and I can't remember, some of you NASCAR buffs may know exactly how he finished that race, but he finished pretty high up on the list. So that was called drafting. That is an essential uh, strategy in NASCAR to this day. And I'm like the only guy from Alabama who's not a NASCAR fan. So this is more of a history thing to me. But it's an essential strategy in uh, NASCAR today. And it's coming and trucking, only we're not going to call it drafting. We're going to call it platooning. And it's going to be a lot more high tech than just a good old boy who used to run whiskey tucking in in front of the Pontiac in front of him. Uh, again, this. Uh, platooning report that I helped uh, put together for NAFSI. It's available, free download. Uh, go to truckingefficiency.org. Uh, there's a lot of information in there, uh, payback calculators, a lot of interviews with a lot of people. Uh, this is the first forward-looking report that NAFSI has done. Usually, uh, NAFSI digs in and does research on a, an existing technology. This is the first time we're really trying to look into the, uh, to the crystal ball, try to figure out what's coming, how it's going to come, how it's going to happen. And we also talked to a lot of people, and we found out there's a lot of concerns, fears, and misconceptions about this technology. And before I go too much deeper into this, I've got a quick video we'd like to show you, and I think this kind of sums things up very neatly. Platooning takes advantage of many technologies that are already being adopted by fleets. So the building blocks for platooning are already there. I really think the fuel economy benefits of this technology are going to be something that fleets are just not going to be able to resist. People are worried about uh, safety for the, for the most part. They're worried about uh, a driver's reaction times, being able to respond to threats. They're worried about situational awareness, drivers, particularly in the trailing vehicles, being able to assess threats, see risks before they develop. In actuality, the safety systems on the truck react much, much, much faster than a human driver can. And so, frankly, by the time the driver gets his foot to the brake pedal and even begins to initiate a braking sequence, the truck has already slowed down and is braking away from whatever the threat is. I think fleets will be interested in it once they are comfortable with the safety and, of course, once drivers are, are better accepting of the technology. One of the challenges with platooning, though, is that as this is all being developed now, the standards need to become just that, standard, so that the communication messages are sent in, a, in the exact same way regardless of the brand, so that um, a Volvo can talk to a Mac, a Mac can talk to a Freightliner, can talk to a Kenworth or a Peterbilt. Platooning is, has a, a great potential because of the shared fuel economy savings between the combination of vehicles. Again, it, it's a safe operation because the trucks are constantly monitoring each other's position. And again, the, the thing is, uh, people think that trucks need to be fully automatic and everything, but really when a truck starts to slow down, the driver becomes very engaged because he's used to not doing anything when he's in cruise control. And so you'll get his attention fairly quickly just by slowing the vehicle, and then we go into an active braking situation. I think we need to see what the real benefits are out on the road. Uh, my guess is initially at least, very limited application because you have to have a number of trucks going in the same direction, essentially loaded to the same levels, but I think eventually it, it makes sense. There's a lot of things that need to be understood uh, before we see wide scale, but clearly I see uh, early adopters, you know, big fleets that have lots of trucks that are often within a couple of miles of each other traveling the freeway, or we've got some LTL operations where two tractor trailers are already together how can we safely platoon them and save a lot of money? It's great. It's proven. It's, um, you know, the fuel economy's there, the savings there. We're looking forward to it. All right. That's sort of platooning in a nutshell or platooning 101. 
Uh, just real quick, uh, we're not gonna, I'm not going to go into depth on the report, but a few things we discovered uh, as we put it together. Really, um, this is a pathway towards autonomous vehicles. It's, uh, there is a high degree of autonomous uh, technology in these vehicles. More will come, and it's going to be sort of a key component in getting this industry used to the concept of autonomous vehicle systems and how they work. Um, benefits. Um, quite frankly, there's not a lot of blood left in that turnip. That's what uh, Freightliner's uh, chief design engineer told me when it comes to truck designs. And this is pretty much a free, uh, anywhere from 4 to 10 percent boost in fuel economy, uh, using a lot of technology that, quite frankly, some of you guys are already using every day on your tractors. Uh, overall, a two-truck platoon, we think we're going to see about a 4 percent uh, fuel economy increase, and that's for both vehicles in the platoon. Uh, the rear vehicle generally gets a higher percentage of fuel economy boost. That's around 8%. We also found, we believe this is going to accelerate uh, the already high adoption rate that's uh, with safety technologies. Um, there are challenges. This isn't going to be uh, easy. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, there's some questions on payback, how the drivers are going to react. Uh, Platoon integrity, and what that basically means is, you know, how does the platoon stay together? What happens if vehicles cut in and out? System security. A lot of people don't realize there are very sophisticated protocols that some of the other experts will talk about in a minute when the trucks start talking to each other to decide how they're going to platoon, and there's some, uh, there's some worry about that data. Um, a lot of people want to know, well, how much time will you actually spend platooning in a vehicle? Uh, there's clearly from this industry going to be ha have to be a legislative and public awareness uh, educational campaign. How are the fuel savings shared? Uh, the lead vehicle gets a lower uh, fuel economy boost than the trailing vehicle. So why on earth would anyone want to be in the uh, lead position all the time? Uh, how reliability is this going to be? What about litigation? That's a very interesting question. Um, Based on the findings and recommendations, again, you can go to the report, see everything in detail. Uh, at the moment, NAFSI has a fairly high degree of confidence in this technology in terms of fuel savings. Technology is available today. The following distances are not as great, is as commonly um, misconceived right now. 40 to 50 feet to start with, we think that will go closer as people get more comfortable with the technology. Um, at the moment, it's being sort of unfairly billed as a fully autonomous technology, that is not correct. There's a lot of worry about the impact on the drivers, particularly in the, in the trailing vehicles. We discovered that is not as uh, big a problem was, was imagined, and as I said, it will accelerate the adoption of safety technologies. That's it for me. Look forward to hearing your questions later, and uh, bringing up Josh Schwitkus now, and he's going to uh, tell you a little bit more. Thank you, Jack. I appreciate you adjusting your schedule to, to fill in here, as, as Jack said. Next, I'm going to bring up Josh. Um, he's going to give you a few more details about platooning. Uh, several months ago, uh, I was in the audience at an energy independence event uh, at the museum in Washington, D.C. Uh, Josh came up and did a very brief presentation as part of the event. Uh, and being in the audience, I was looking around, and, and a number of people were scratching their heads at the beginning, wondering why he was talking about trucks at this event. Uh, by the end of his short presentation, I saw many of the same people nodding their heads in approval over it, and I took that as a very good sign for uh, uh, trucking. So with that, Josh, uh, podium's Great. yours. All right. Thank you, Neil, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. To uh, I just have a couple of brief slides and a couple of videos to run through to tell you a little bit more about Peloton, uh, a little bit more about platooning. Um, so uh, Peloton is all about connecting and automating trucks. Uh, so we're starting with platooning, uh, and we're connecting truck to truck and truck to the cloud, truck to the internet. And I'll talk briefly about each of those today. Uh, and we're excited about how we're working with the industry. Uh, I'll talk about some of the partners we're working with in a minute, but working with the industry uh, to get the new levels of safety, new levels of fuel efficiency, and new levels of operational efficiency. These are all our goals as we work together with, with all of you. Um, Briefly about Peloton, we're backed by a lot of companies familiar to, to all of you, uh, including uh, Volvo Trucks, uh, which uh, it's great to be here staring at the, the beautiful Volvo Super Truck, uh, but other major industry players, UPS, uh, Tier 1 suppliers like Denso and Magna, uh, and so on. 
Um, so I, we are also free to work across the industry, and we're working with a variety of braking suppliers, a variety of truck OEMs, uh, to try to bring this type of technology to all of you across your fleets. Our goal is no matter what, no matter what tractor you buy with whatever equipment, we want it to be using a Peloton system uh, to be safer, to be more fuel efficient, and to be more operationally efficient. Uh, we'll start with a platooning video uh, that's sort of more about our system and how it's used by the driver. So we can roll that, that first video. How's Emma doing? She misses you. I know. I'll be home soon. How's it going up front? They're clearing up a jam in Grand Junction, but it should be good by the time we get there. How's it going back there? We got a Challenger coming up on us real fast. Cut in detected. All right, the Challenger is exiting now. 10-4, where are you headed? I'm going home. It's my daughter's first birthday. Before you know it, she'll be running. I'm going to stop for fuel up ahead. Sounds good. I'm going to keep going. Stay safe out there. Thanks, I will. Platoon ending. Great. So, so the system you saw there and, and uh, what you heard about a minute ago is, is platooning. The basic idea is to take the active safety systems that many of you are buying today. Uh, so you may be buying the Meritor WAPCO On Guard system, Bendix Wingman, uh, or Detroit Assurance. Um, uh, take those systems and connect them between a pair of trucks. So we have a direct wireless link between the two trucks. Uh, you can think of it sort of like Wi-Fi, but it's an automotive standard, much more reliable than Wi-Fi. Um, there's a constant communication link between the trucks. So whatever the front truck does, the rear truck knows about it basically instantly. Uh, so within about a hundredth of a second. Um, so immediately when the front truck accelerates, we automatically accelerate the rear truck right along with it. When the front truck applies its brakes, we know about that immediately. Uh, we actually know about it before the brake lag has occurred. So immediately when the brakes are applied, we're sending that information to the rear truck. So we're actually typically braking in the rear truck before the front truck has slowed down. Uh, this is something even the best driver in the world, even the best sensor in the world can't do um, because there's nothing to sense yet, right? It's before that, that truck has, has physically slowed down. Um, so this creates a very high level of safety. We can prevent the most common accidents um, on the highway, which are these frontal collisions caused by just not reacting in time. And we do this completely automatically. So if your drivers are, are uh, you know, not paying attention for a few seconds, if they sneeze, something like that, uh, at the wrong moment, the system will still react for them. Um, this type of system and, and the underpinning of it, uh, the uh, collision mitigation system, has shown great safety benefits. There are fleets we've talked to who, when they added collision mitigation and uh, lane departure warning systems, have seen an 80% reduction in accidents. Um, so I encourage all of you, even outside of platooning, if you're not already looking into those systems, please do. Uh, they can have a profound safety impact. They also work well with platooning. They are the underpinnings of platooning. Um, and so those two can go together. Um, in our system, in this first system, the drivers are, are steering in both trucks. Um, so as Jack mentioned, it's not a fully automated truck. You'll hear more about that in a minute from me briefly and later on from, uh, from Anthony from Auto. 
uh, about full automation. Uh, with platooning, the driver is completely in command and control of the vehicle. Their abilities are just added to by this vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle link. Uh, in addition to the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, we connect every truck to the cloud. Um, so most of you have uh, one of you know, a variety of telematics or fleet management services uh, where, your, where your trucks are talking to the cloud. Um, we have a similar type of connection, but for us, we, we use it to run what we call the Platooning Network Operations Center. And what this is responsible for is making sure your trucks only platoon where it's safe, when it's safe, and how it's safe. Uh, so meaning initially we're restricting it to certain types of roads, and most importantly, roads that we have driven on and we know will be safe to platoon on. Um, over time, we'll expand the, the types of roads, uh, and with some of the fleet partners we're working with, we're looking at which roads to focus on first so we can bring maximum value to you uh, Im immediately. Uh, we also adjust the platooning based on weather conditions, based on traffic conditions, uh, and so on. Um, We'll show one more video here, which is uh, the closest I can do to giving you all a demonstration of platooning. I can't put you all in our trucks uh, today, but we'll show a video that gives you kind of a sense of, of what it's like to platoon. Mm. Uh, and this is a video from uh, about a year and a half ago at ITS World Congress, an event in Detroit. Uh, you see here the video display that shows the rear driver, the view from the front truck's perspective. Uh, and in a second, you'll see the demonstration we like to give where we apply the brakes in the front truck and you feel that immediately in the rear truck. Yeah, watch how quickly our brakes come on versus his taillights. Okay, Ron, we're clear. Let's do a brake stop. Brake. Um, as soon as his lights came on, we were braking. So that's how quickly we respond to his uh, mm -hmm. signal. So when you're riding in the truck, of course, it's, it's more powerful than when you're, when you're watching the video, but you can see the front truck applied its brakes, the rear truck applied them basically simultaneously. It was about 10 milliseconds later, but visually and as a passenger in the truck, you can't tell that it's not simultaneous. I want to talk briefly about regulations for platooning. Uh, we have been uh, together with uh, some of our partners and uh, some, some very supportive fleets. Um, We've been working with states to, uh, to have platooning allowed um, initially for tests and trials, um, and later on for full widespread commercial deployment. Uh, there's now 10 states where we can, uh, we can do platooning um, officially. A number of other states, it's a gray area, and we're working with those states to, uh, to either change their laws in a few cases or just have administrative action that allows, allows platooning. Uh, we have found the states, uh, including Nevada, of course, and you'll hear from Jude in a minute, uh, a lot of states very supportive because they know how vital trucking is to their, uh, to their states. Uh, and so this is, this is moving along well, and we don't expect this to slow down deployment uh, of our system. Um, so I mentioned our, you know, our goal as a company is safety, fuel efficiency, and operational efficiency. Platooning saves fuel, uh, as we've talked about, by reducing drag, prevents crashes uh, through this nearly instantaneous braking between the trucks. As you move to higher levels of automation, uh, which you'll hear more about from some of the other speakers, um, that's where you start to, to help on the labor side, right? So you can increase the productivity of each driver. Um, uh, that can potentially eliminate the driver shortage and reduce your labor costs. Um, it also enables other optimization of your, of your fleet. Um, you can look at adjusting the speeds of trucks. You can look at changing the routes um, if you're currently constrained by hours of service rules. Um, you can change time, dispatch timing, and you can more fully utilize equipment. Um, as a company, we are uh, very focused right now on launching platooning. Uh, we'll have it in quantity in, in fleets next year. Um, and then uh, we, on that path, we're working with brake suppliers um, and with most of the OEMs. Um, we are completing a very extensive safety process. So this is a safety critical system. I think there's no doubt about that. And we're going through a, a very extensive process together with the brake suppliers and, and the OEMs. And again, we'll have quantity deliveries in, in uh, 2017. Um, the next step on our roadmap um, is to look at increasing levels of automation of the, of the rear truck uh, with the eventual goal of you know, full automation there. Um, we'll use the same type of supervision I talked about from the cloud, um, and uh, this will bring to market again with key partners uh, to make sure it's, it's truly safe, uh, truly uh, ready, you know, commercially ready to, to be in your fleets. Uh, with that, I'll just uh, uh, show a brief picture of our team. We're, we're working very hard to bring, uh, bring these products to your fleets to, to make the road safer, make your drivers safer, and uh, make all of us safer, and to improve your, your efficiency and, uh, and your bottom line. 
Uh, so thanks for your time. I'm looking forward to the, to the questions. Thank you, Josh. Just as a reminder, the, uh, you should have uh, cards out there. If you have questions, we will be getting to them in, in a little bit. Uh, next, I'm going to turn to uh, Sean. Uh, you know, I recently attended the IAA show in uh, Germany. It's full of eye-catchy world premiere trucks. Some, there's some really cool stuff that's on display there, much uh, as there is here. Um, it, quite possibly, though, the most photographed truck that I saw was, was not brand new, but was the Freightliner Inspiration truck. Uh, really long lines to get inside the cab. People just wanted to touch it. They just, I could sense that they just wanted to, to experience it. That's a truck that debuted here in Nevada at the Hoover Dam. Uh, it was also on display at ATA's conference last year in Philadelphia. Uh, and just watching everyone, I, I got inside and I just observed people looking at it and, and photographing it. It really made me understand that that truck, that event at the Hoover Dam, really had struck a chord with people, not just here in Nevada or in the United States, but truly around the world. And, and it was a really unique, uh, I interesting moment for me to see. Sean, in his role, he played a key role, he played a key role working with the state of Nevada to gain the necessary approvals uh, to make that event happen. Sean, could you come up and, and share a little bit about the uh, Inspiration truck and, and what's going on with Daimler and Freightliner? I suppose that's what I'm here for, so. Thank everyone for coming at, uh, so early in the morning. I have to admit that, uh, you know, when, uh, when you're in charge of running a regulatory group, you certainly don't envision that a large group of people will get up at 8 o'clock in the morning to listen to you talk about uh, regulations and your experience licensing a vehicle. But what we did here in Nevada, what we did here with Jude, was certainly um, uh, an exciting moment in history, I think, and I think we'll all look back on it um, as exactly that. Before I go into my comments, um, for those who haven't seen the video and haven't seen the truck yet, I'm just going to have them run a quick little video uh, to give you a chance to sort of so we're all up to speed with uh, what this truck can do. I have to admit, I hadn't seen the full video yet, so uh, it was pretty nice. You know, a truck like this doesn't happen by accident. The research and development teams at Daimler Trucks, they work hard every single day to set new standards in safety and in fuel efficiency. This is our passion. Trucks are our passion. And we do this because we want to deliver real value to our customers, uh, provide a real return on your investments when you buy our products. But we're constantly pushing the envelope. We constantly are exceeding what is required by safety, by safety requirements, by safety laws and emission levels. Most recently, we didn't stop with the highway pilot. This was just the first step. Most recently in Dusseldorf, Germany, we demonstrated what we call our highway pilot connect. We took our platooning systems that we had, oper that we had demonstrated in Germany, we took our highway pilot system with the autonomous truck here in the US, and we combined the two technologies together. 
so that we had a, we had a vehicle that could both platoon but have the, uh, steering the self-steering mechanism in place as well. So you got the, benefit, the safety benefits of the autonomous truck with the fuel efficiency benefits of the platooning vehicle. Innovations developed in our concepts trucks, which is what these are, opened up new possibilities and help establish what tomorrow's commercial trucks will look like. We are a company of big ideas, I think that's clear. Big ideas are great, but we can't execute on those ideas in a vacuum. You know, this is new cutting edge technology. It's new to us, it's new to regulators, and it's new to the public. In this case, we needed a partner in order to fully execute on our ideas. Frankly, we needed a place where we could test the vehicle. When we decided what we wanted to, we wanted to demonstrate the Inspiration Truck that we wanted to unveil it to the public, which by the way at the time didn't actually have a name Inspiration Truck, but I think it turned out to be a great name, I had the task of determining where could we test this vehicle. So I started my research and I looked, and it actually turns out there's lots of places you could test the vehicle, at least arguably, uh, all the states that have no regulatory scheme in place. And then we looked at the laws of Nevada. Nevada had a comprehensive regulatory scheme. It was challenging, especially for the testing requirements uh, in order to get the testing plate. And ultimately, we decided that we didn't want to just do this test anywhere. We wanted to do it in a place that had a strict regulatory requirements, someone that was going to put us to the test, someone that's going to make us get in the truck and show a third party how that vehicle worked. We believed and still believe it is important when showing new technology to make sure that the public is comfortable with that technology, that it's safe and ready to operate on the highway. So we wanted to do it in a regulatory environment that set safety and other standards concerning vehicle testing and driver training. I remember back when, I first, uh, tried to when we first decided we were gonna go uh, test the vehicles in Nevada, to cold calling the Nevada DMV, didn't know anyone there, and uh, Jude immediately picked up the phone, and I, and I, and I was nervous about it, because we wanted to test in Nevada, we knew that, in fact, uh, we were very committed to that, um, but I didn't really know how exactly it was gonna work. You know, you can, you can read the regulations and they say one thing, um, but there's a lot of flexibility in how regulations are interpreted. And I was also nervous because this project was top secret. We didn't tell anyone. Even within Daimler, we kept it to a very close circle of people who knew about it. And once you go to a third party, you get kind of nervous that, you know, word could get out. And, it, and I'm happy to say it never did. But I quickly learned that Nevada was a place to do business. Nevada was a place that wanted to demonstrate this, this key technology. So I got on a plane with the head of our, our now head of advanced engineering, and uh, we flew out and met with Jude and his entire team. And we quickly you know, sat down, we explained to them how our technology worked. They explained to us how their regulations worked. They even gave us a few ideas as to things we could do to improve on our, uh, improve on our truck to make it safer for the roadways. And it ended up being a great partnership, a true example of government and private industry working together towards a common goal. We are pleased that we accomplished our goal and that we started a conversation about autonomous vehicles. And I want to leave us lots of time for Q&A. I think that's important here today, and I think it's the most interesting part of the discussion. But I have a few points I want to make about autonomous vehicles in general. First, the future of autonomous vehicles, as far as we can see into the future, is still with the driver in control of the vehicle. There are frankly lots of decisions that a human needs to make. Second, I would say the technology is in its early days. We aren't going to have all the answers to your questions. I think it's important that we're candid and honest about that. We see the demonstration of the Freightliner Inspiration Truck and the demonstration of the Highway Pilot Connect as a way to start asking necessary questions about autonomous commercial vehicles and an open dialogue that will shape the future. There are plenty of questions that need to be addressed. What regulations will be put in place and by whom? The states or the federal government? If an autonomous vehicle is in an accident, who's at fault? The driver? The trucking company? a vehicle manufacturer, the, the designer of the road, the human driver of the other vehicle? There are lots of questions I could ask, and uh, I would, but then I would be taking away your job, Neil. So uh, I look forward to our conversation today, and I think it's a conversation we're going to continue for years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. I next want to go to Anthony, uh, Anthony Lewandowski. He, he was a late addition to our panel. Uh, he's co-founder of Auto, uh, which has been developing an autonomous driving kit uh, in the aftermarket for heavy-duty trucks. It was recently acquired by Uber, 
and uh, Lewandowski is now uh, heading the company's autonomous driving operations. Uh, he previously worked on Google's self-driving car project, uh, and some of you may remember him from ATA's Technology Summit uh, in Dallas, which was held in 2013. All right. Good morning, and uh, welcome to Nevada. Um, so here talking about self-driving trucks, uh, and generally the future of how we see uh, trucking. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I love robots. Uh, I built a uh, robot motorcycle in 2005, three. Um, and it's in the Smithsonian now. Uh, I went on to, like all good college students, uh, build a pizza delivery uh, robots to deliver pizza across the Golden Gate Bridge to Treasure Island, um, which kind of turned into the Google self-driving car project. Um, and earlier this year, I left to start out of my garage in Palo Alto, a uh, self-driving truck company. And it turns out not all driveways can handle the weight of a uh, Class A truck. Um, so with that, we built Auto, and uh, we, uh, Uber recently acquired Auto uh, about a month ago. And now I lead Uber's self-driving trucks and car uh, effort. So we're here talking a little bit about what's the future of transportation and what's that going to look like uh, soon. And so the thought is, like, what is trucking and what is the future of transportation and who do you want to have as, as partners? And we think there's two things that matter to that. One is liquidity, and the other one is automation. And the way we see liquidity is being able to have uh, carriers being matched with shippers efficiently and finding more business so that you don't have backhauls that are empty. Uh, you have business you know, uh, both ways. And in automation, where how do we elevate the safety and availability and predictability of the drivers? So we'll talk a little bit about liquidity. Uh, who here has used uh, Uber before? All right, awesome, thank you. Um, for the rest of you, you should try it out, it's really cool. Um, anyway, so once you, you, do, you provide a liquidity of having drivers everywhere all the time where you can press a button and a car shows up, there's many other things you can start doing with that. One of these, uh, Uber Eats, for instance, which is if you're delivering people, why not deliver food? Why not deliver packages? And if you're going delivering packages, why not do freight? Now, obviously, your Prius can't carry uh, a load from a factory to a distribution center, but it's the same principle uh, that we want to apply that we have from Uber uh, today for passengers as Uber for freight. So if you think about it, we've expanded, and right now, even for Walmart, we do the last mile delivery of when you place an order for Walmart online, you can have Uber deliver your order to your house. So think about this, we're providing a liquidity transportation uh, in the marketplace so that you can always find uh, a ride for yourself or always find a driver, ideally, for your uh, shipment. Um, so let's talk about automation. Um, so we recently we launched uh, about 14 uh, self-driving Ubers in Pittsburgh, and they're constantly driving uh, around and picking up people uh, just as uh, the regular uh, Uber X would. They still have safety drive inside it, but we're pushing for the technology to grow and be uh, better than the best driver. So the goal is once you have a vehicle that can drive better than the best driver, um, same thing as uh, Uber and Uber Eats, you want to be able to take that driver and put them on everything. So that applies to trucking. So we're going to show a little video here, uh, if we can. Right, thank you. So uh, let's talk about freight a little bit. Uh, it's a huge uh, business. Uh, it's basically the circulatory system of the American uh, economy. You know, you can't, everything you see in this room came on a truck. 
Uh, and if you look at it, you know, the way uh, trucks are being driven today by truck drivers dictates how the logistics of the whole country looks like. Uh, where are the distribution centers uh, placed such that if you were to have um, you know, five distribution centers, for instance, you would place them like this. It shows you where you could get to within one day's worth of driving, uh, mainly due to uh, hours of service uh, regulations. Uh, if you look at like how hours of service regulations, well, they're confusing, they're long, they're hard, uh, they don't quite make sense. Uh, at the end of the day, they're even enforced on paper. Uh, it's 2016, guys. Uh, how are we still enforcing hours of service on paper? Um, so I think that's going to change in the future. Obviously, there's a mandate for doing this. Uh, but with technology, I think we can enforce this you know, automatically. And what does it mean for a computer to have hours of service? It doesn't really make sense. You know, the reason why a human um, needs hours of service is because biologically we get tired. If we look forward, like, what does technology do? Uh, technology in general gets cheaper over time, and it makes our lives better. You know, we get a cell phone in our pocket that allows us to communicate to anybody in the world within a second. That's pretty amazing. And so if we look back at some similar technology, not 2D elevators that move uh, freight from one place on Earth to another place, but a 1D elevator that goes up and down uh, uh, you know, a building of some sort, either a hotel or, or office building. If you look at what technology happened to that compared to what we're doing in the trucking industry, this, this, I think there's a lot of corollaries. Um, doors used to be opened and closed manually by this operator because it wasn't motorized. Uh, same thing, the speed at which the elevator would go up and down was a lever that would throttle this you know, elevator up and down, so you needed an expert operator for doing it. Um, and there was no way to stop at the right spot. So these are all very simple things, but if you think about it, you know, the way we drive a truck, um, you gotta stay in the lane and not run over things, be it a car, a deer, a person, road debris. Uh, so you can break it down in a simple way like that. We just don't have the right, you know, up until now, we haven't had the right technology for seeing the world, digitizing in 3D, and understanding where should the truck stop, where should the truck drive around. Uh, so it's very similar to elevator uh, operators, I feel like, uh, going forward. Um, same thing in terms of, like, connectivity. How do uh, brokers uh, help shippers and carriers get connected up? Uh, it's very much a phone and fax game, which to me reminds me a lot of uh, early days when you wanted to make a telephone call. Uh, you would call up the operator and say, like, hey, I want to talk to Bob, and they would literally, like, patch you through to Bob. Uh, and so, you know, it's 2016, we now make phone calls that are automatically connected. Why isn't our shipments uh, automatically connected from the carrier to the shipper and, and vice versa? So I think we want to bring kind of two pieces of technology that have been missing uh, uh, in the market there. Um, you know, part of, of liquidity means reducing the amount of wasted fuel and energy by having empty miles on, uh, you know, some empty miles are, are going to happen, it's just mathematically impossible to get rid of all of them, but I think we do a lot better at providing clarity of the, the market of like where are their loads, where are their trucks, and how do we make the whole system as a whole more efficient. Uh, same thing in the LTL, there's a lot of inefficiencies as how do you actually fill up the truck and optimize for the right route. Um, so with that, you know, why did the hours of service come in? Well, it turns out that uh, the longer you drive, the more tired you get, the more likely you are to get in a collision. So if you see this, this is a graph going up and up to the right, up until seven hours of driving where you have a mandated brake. And so it shows you what the effect of that brake really is on the chances of having a, a safety critical uh, event. Um, and this basically also means that like one in four drivers after driving 11 hours are gonna have some sort of safety critical event, which is leaving the lane or hard braking or some sort. And we think that we can bring technology to make that uh, much better. Um, so, you know, what would it look like in the future? This is kind of one of our Volvo trucks that we retrofit. Um, you know, we love to partner with the OEMs and bake in our technology, but we think the technology is going to be ready uh, before the need for baking it in at an OEM uh, stage. And so, you know, we see in the future um, with uh, automation fundamentally changing how distribution centers are being placed in the U.S. Uh, instead of having, you know, them being scattered based on this one-hour delivery, you know, can you go 400 miles away, you know, 500 miles away, it's going to be more like 1,000 miles of driving every time. Um, we also don't think the future of trucking looks anything like this uh, from the truck driver standpoint. We really think it's more something like this. Uh, if you look at the cost of the truck uh, that is related to driver comfort, you know, it's 30 to 40% of it. And so imagine if as a fleet operator uh, you can get 40% more trucks just because you have 
uh, no need for the creature comforts, air conditioning, uh, seats, seat belts, uh, windshields uh, that you would uh, normally put on your existing fleet. And then on top of that, having your fleet being able to operate 24 hours a day, uh, 365. That seems like a pretty exciting future to me. Um, so with that, you know, we were launching uh, shortly here um, Uber Freight uh, Marketplace for finding uh, backhaul jobs for all of your trucks. And uh, uh, we're going to go also roll out the self-driving technology to those that uh, use the marketplace the most. So we don't think that it's uh, necessarily going to be sold for profit. We think we want to make this to, to boost the network efficiency. And so we want people to uh, you know, participate in that, uh, Uber Freight. Uh, and so with that, um, if you go to testdrive.ot.to, you're welcome to uh, beta test. And otherwise, you can send us emails at, oh, the last slide didn't make it anyway. Um, thank you very much, and uh, look forward to hearing your questions. Leave that there. OK, last but not least, I, I want to bring up Jude from uh, Nevada DMV, maybe to bring a slightly different perspective. Uh, I've had a number of phone calls uh, with him uh, in recent months. Uh, his, his passion and belief in the safety benefits uh, in automation and what's going on here is obvious. Uh, it's also clear talking to him that he's a fan of trucking, that uh, he gets it. Um, Jude's worked closely with several of our panelists, as has been mentioned. Uh, he's also worked with Nevada Trucking Association and a number of other groups. Jude, can you come up and share some of your experiences and perspectives on this discussion? Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. So the first question is, how many have had more than two cups of coffee? Raise your hands. OK, I'm going to be speaking to this side of the, the audience who didn't raise their hand at all. So um, thank you for allowing me to be here. Uh, I feel honored to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm amongst experts, not only in the stage, but in the audience as well. So what I'm providing today is just the state perspective of the state of Nevada, as well as some thoughts on, on the national end as well. Um, just to give you a highlight overview of what Nevada has done and in the last, as well as the last uh, 12 months, we've been pretty busy. Uh, in 2011, we were, um, there was a bill submitted to actually allow Nevada to be the first state to create autonomous regulations. Uh, that, um, ironically, uh, Anthony Lewandowski, is, this is like a family reunion up here because all these people I've dealt with before, so it's great to see him. But Anthony was with Google at that time, and um, through David Goldwater's uh, expertise in, in the state of Nevada, they um, provided a bill through the 2011 legislative session to actually create the first autonomous um, laws in the state of Nevada, in the nation, and from what I understand in the world. So we had a very challenging um, goal ahead of us. And in four months, we had to bring all the stakeholders together, not only in the industry, but in the federal government, as well as law enforcement, insurance companies, and, and so forth, to bring together to try to comprise a, and build a regulations. These regulations were basically, we were required to build a testing regulations, uh, insurance requirements, definitions. And on the si other side of the coin, we were building uh, consumer deployment regulations. So when the industry was making a business decision to actually come in and implement their uh, autonomous technology, whether through dealerships and, and or uh, retrofitting onto existing vehicles, we needed to make sure that we had regulations intact. So in March of 2012, we adopted that, uh, those regulations, um, and we have been busy since then. We right now have about six uh, companies that are actually testing. Uh, we have licensed them to test in the state of Nevada, and a variety of companies, Google and uh, Hyundai, I'm glad, glad to see they're here, uh, Delphi and um, Daimler Trucking, which was a, a great partner and fantastic uh, experience with us, um, Mercedes-Benz. And um, I have to say with Daimler, uh, not only we were the first with the regulations, the first with the creating a testing program, first to creating a consumer deployment regulations, 
We were also the first uh, state to willing to say, hey, we see Daimler's uh, technology. We can see that this is something that we can partner with. And we're not afraid of a challenge. Nevada will never be afraid of a challenge. And especially with experts like you folks in the industry and, and the technologies that are in this convention alone, just walking through here is amazing. Uh, and my hat is off to you folks because it's exciting technology that I think will actually produce uh, more uh, safer driving, uh, reduce fatalities, and reduce crashes. So it was just a, a pleasure to work with Daimler. And um, if, any, if, if anyone knows about that Daimler experience, they, uh, one of their parts was uh, displaying um, some of their videos on the face of Hoover Dam. And so next time I go through Hoover Dam, I'm waiting for a movie to be displayed, and I can't, you know, I can't see it. So it's just as amazing, as amazing in itself. So we have been in since January of 2016. We have been taking into new heights in, the, in uh, autonomous um, and advanced technology systems. Uh, in January, the, the uh, Governor Sandoval. Uh, initiated and created a Nevada um, Center for Advanced Mobility. This is a new unit under the Governor's Office of Economic Development, and this was the single point of contact for the state of Nevada, and that a a new unit is basically partnering with uh, agencies like the Department of Motor Vehicles, the Department of Transportation, uh, the Department of Public Safety, our law enforcement, business and industry who regulates our taxi, shuttle services, and buses, um, we are also working with our city and, and county agencies, as well as our regional transportation service uh, centers. Um, and we are building as a state a mechanism so that when advanced technology comes our way and we can partner with industry, we're not only working on a state level, but we're working from the governor's office down to the state level to city and county levels to coordinate the partnerships with industry. We are making an impression to make sure that our partnerships with industry is going to be different than a lot of people would ever imagine. When you think state government, federal government, you see me wrapped in red tape and bureaucracy. We're gonna cut that off. We've cut it off since 2011. And we're gonna take the same format as we did in 2011 and sitting down with the industry experts and finding out what we can do to partner with you in a very common sense and safe approach to making sure your technologies flourish, can be tested, and then eventually be introduced into the consumer uh, public so that those technology benefits can actually benefit everyone. Uh, we have also been very busy in the last year uh, in that new Center for Advanced Mobility system. We're working with companies that are interested in having a low-speed, fully autonomous vehicle for taxi shuttle services uh, here in Las Vegas. And we are working with them currently right now, not only in the testing realm, but in the uh, demonstration or pilot uh, perspective to hopefully introduce that possibly be by the end of this year for the next CES convention and so forth. We're working with industry as well, sending out surveys on platooning. A lot of you folks, uh, Daimler and uh, Peloton and Volvo and others and Peterbilt have actually provided some great insight into uh, what concerns they have. We're working with them and our law enforcement communities to make sure that Nevada is an open door for any company that wants to come in and, and do some t testing and platooning as well as autonomous. We don't, <laughs> the, biggest, <laughs> the biggest thing I've heard from the surveys was we don't want to get pulled over by law enforcement. Well, you don't have to worry about that. We've got a mechanism in place to make sure that in the interim that we're working with law enforcement to, to make them aware of the companies that are platooning in our state and some interim approaches of you know flagging the, the vehicles as in a test mode or, or whatever. If you are pulled over uh, from Nevada, you'll probably get a, a roll of nickels and a drink coupon and we'll go from there. So it's just Nevada. If there's any law enforcement in here, just joking. So just don't, don't you got guns, I'm just joking. So, uh, but 
We take a common sense approach on this, folks, and I think we have to because this is cutting edge technology that is shaking up the industry, but we also have to take a common sense approach to this and can't wrap this in red tape. You folks have technology out there that needs to be in, in the hands of our citizens and so that we can start saving lives and reducing crashes and having a better experience for our trucking um, drivers out there. Um, out of service requirements on the federal level, I see this technology actually helping in a lot of ways. I, I, I see the trucking industry evolving into a very high tech industry. We are all right now, but I think it's increasing in, in great droves. So I will leave you with that. Um, I will. Uh, don't want to give too much, but I want to open up for questions as we roll through this. And uh, again, thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this and the only state official up here. I have a Keflar suit, so I'm not worried if anybody shoots me. So I'm in good shape. So thank you again and looking forward to your questions. All right. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jude. I, I want to stay with you for a minute and we're going to get off topic. Uh, off trucking for a split second. Last week, right here in Las Vegas, there was a, an event we talked about you feel is very important in terms of the larger technology picture. Uh, uh, can, can you share about what went down ju just not far from here last week? Sure. Um, thank you very much for allowing me to do that. Um, last week, just to show you another level of where we're taking this technology, last week we, we had a media event with a company called Aero Electronics. Aero Electronics is one of those companies that we actually reached out to after we did our research, my team and I. They were able in four months to create a vehicle that can actually allow a quadriplegic to operate that vehicle. That's cutting edge technology that is amazing. So what we did in that process of the last 15 months working with them, we knew that we had to, in order for them to take this from a controlled environment, racetracks and so forth, we needed to make sure that we expanded our regulations and testing to allow this type of company and any other type of advanced technology company that, that wants to test on our highways to, to create an additional safety net so not only they could test safely, our citizens on the street would be safe, and everybody would be a win-win situation. So we created additional regulations, took a little time, but we got that through. And just to tell you about this technology, when, you, when we talk about autonomous vehicles, this is about a person engaging the system, and the vehicle actually operates as the driver. The driver is not touching anything. Well, in this vast technology that Aero Electronics created, the vehicle, the person was not touching anything. He's a quadriplegic. In fact, his name is Sam Schmidt. He's a resident of Henderson, Nevada. He's an ex-professional race car driver and in his racing uh, profession, got in a crash and became a paraplegic. They built this system around him and this system allows him through a sip and puff method that he uses for his wheelchair. If he uh, breathes out, it accelerates the pedal on the vehicle. If he breathes in, it operates the brakes. He has sensors on his glasses that if he moves his head, the steering wheel actually operates. And you say, well, is he driving by himself? No. Some of the safety features is and his front passenger there who is fully trained has identical steering pedal and um, brake acceleration um, mechanisms on, the, on that person's side. So if by any chance that there was a issue, that person in a split second can take full control of the vehicle. We also require that the company have a pilot car in front of the, uh, their autonomous vehicle while they're testing. And when we took them out on a the drive demonstration, it was amazing because Sam Schmidt is as a professional. All he did, and we took him through residential areas, we took him through highway, freeway uh, areas, merging on the traffic.
He took that and ran with it, and all he did was showed how many bad drivers there are out there. <laughs> he really did a fantastic job. This is an individual that took this car at 152 miles an hour around a racetrack, went up to Pikes Peak in 15 minutes, actually beat some of the people that were actually entered in to Pikes Peak. He's taken this and proven this technology, and this is the kind of technology that we're willing as Nevada to say, we're not afraid of the challenge. Let's build a common sense safety approach to this and make this happen so that this benefit, this technology could actually, and hopefully some OEM out there might say, this is a kind of technology we would like to put on some of our vehicles so that the handicapped individuals out there, our wounded warriors coming back from our war, that can't drive anymore. This allows some freedom to them to have a totally a vehicle at their, at, their, uh, at their means and they can drive and have that independence back. So we're pretty excited about that. It's just another um, chapter in our session. So thanks for allowing me to introduce that as well. So. Thank you, Jude. Okay, uh, I had a whole bunch of questions, but, but you guys have done a great job of making making things real easy on me. Uh, that was uh, Seth Clevenger who came up. Uh, he's TT's technology editor. We, we had planned a little halftime show, I guess. Uh, he wanted to talk, uh, uh, we want to share the message how besides the companies on stage, how much really is going on, whether it be OEMs, uh, the safety technology companies. Um, he had done some, uh, an active uh, steering, automatic steering uh, demonstration uh, this summer. Unfortunately, Seth has 100% completely lost his voice and it happened before the concert last night, so th that's not what, what it was. So I just want to acknowledge him. He had played a, a large role in helping put this together, and, and it's unfortunate that, that we're going to have to skip that. But, but also, I'm going to take these stack of cards now, and, and I see already looking at them, we had gotten several dozen before we arrived today, and, and, and many themes continue to repeat. I think it shows the importance on safety that, that people have regarding this and also a sense that this is becoming more real. The, the questions in the past had been so skeptical. People have some, some, some real ones, I, I guess I would put it. Uh, this one keeps coming up. Uh, I'll ask it in a few different ways. Who, some, if something happens, uh, Sean alluded to it, and maybe don't have the answer. Something happens. Who is liable? Are you guys liable? Is, is an OEM liable? One of the, these uh, is the driver? This keeps coming up. It, it, along with that, if uh, how is the system going to be set up uh, if it's an unavoidable accident? What does the system do? Does it protect the driver of the vehicle, or does it uh, run into a, I've heard it asked as a busload of nuns, school children? I mean, these are serious questions that show the, 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 the safety issues. Who is liable? How is it set up? Who is protected? Who is not in an unavoidable situation? Well, um, I, I think there's two parts to that question, one for platooning, mm -hmm. one for full automation. Maybe I'll start with the platooning part, and then I can hand it off to the others for, for full automation. Uh, so for platooning, um, uh, we have a very clear description in our, uh, in our sales agreement um, uh, with the fleets. Um, and so some of you may have seen our sales agreement. Uh, most of you haven't. Um, we make very clear the capabilities of the system and the responsibilities of the driver. Um, the system will, what we, what we warrant and guarantee um, is that rear truck is going to react to the front truck no matter what, um, and any action by the front truck, meaning no matter how hard the front driver applies the brakes, the rear truck will react in time and we will ensure the rear truck does not hit the front truck. Um, that is the basic safety functionality of platooning. Uh, beyond that, we don't warrant that, you know, the driver isn't going to, uh, you know, uh, steer off the road or perform other, you know, other dangerous actions. Um, but we warrant that the platooning function itself will be will be safe. Um, and maybe I know it wasn't quite the question. The question was what, you know, what happens if there's an accident. I want to touch briefly on some of the typical sort of failure cases people think about for platooning. Uh, one of them was in the video, which is the cut in uh, by a car between the trucks. Uh, we automatically detect that and we react by backing the rear truck away, slowing down the rear truck to, to make space. Uh, then the rear driver can press a button to re-engage and, and pull back in. Uh, another one people ask about a lot is what if there's a tire blowout uh, on the front truck uh, or other, you know, other, other cases like that where the front truck decelerates rapidly. 
Um, the reality is any deceleration like that, it may be jarring when there's a blowout. It's actually much less deceleration than what you can do by applying the brakes. So the rear truck will react to that. We'll keep that gap um, just fine. Um, part of the reason we're able to do that is we look at the braking abilities of the two trucks. So we make sure the better braking truck is in the back. Um, that is a huge safety increase over the situation today where your drivers are following behind someone. It's a big white box in front of them. They don't know the braking capabilities of, of, of that truck. Um, so anyway, a little bit about the, about the safety side. Um, in our specific case of platooning, if the rear truck failed to react, which it's not going to, but that would be on us. That's absolutely our liability, and we're making sure that does not happen. That's, you know, that's why we're working with the brake suppliers, uh, why we're doing a lot of testing of various types, going through a full safety process. Um, but that would be on us. Anything else is, uh, is unrelated to platooning. Anyone else? So I would say, um, I, look at it, I look at it sort of two different ways. Um, in the short term, you know, with the Inspiration truck, we're operating under very controlled circumstances. We have a safety plan in place with the state of Nevada. We have a lead vehicle and a follow vehicle that are outside of the uh, autonomous vehicles. We have, a drive, we have two drivers, actually, who are uh, uh, in the vehicle at all times. Um, you know, we're both the manufacturer and the operator. Um, you know, so, so for those type of situations, if something goes wrong with the technology, then we'd be responsible. Um, but we also have an electronic data recorder that measures 60 seconds before, or that stores data after an accident to sort of help determine who's at fault, because the regular traffic rules still apply. If a driver's at fault, obviously, um, they're going to be responsible, and if the equipment's uh, at fault, uh, we're also, we'd be responsible. But I look at it for the long-term picture, and I say we don't have to answer the question today, which is why I prefaced my comments earlier with I don't have all the answers. It gives me an out for every question. <laughs> um, but we don't have to answer the question today. What we have to do is get to a point where the technology reduces the number of accidents, reduces the number of deaths on the road. And if we do that, if we cut the number of accidents down in half, then the total pie of liability is greatly reduced. And then you can figure out, we will figure out how to divide that liability, whether it's through product life, whether it's manufacturers taking more responsibility but charging for that, whether it's insurance companies giving reductions for people having the technology. There's lots of ways we can accomplish the, um, we can sort out the liability picture as long as we get to the point where we're re reducing accidents and saving lives. Yes, yeah, so I would say, um, like it or not, there's actually a system in place today for dealing with any kind of malfunction or accident that you would happen. And so if you look at it, we could just apply the same rules going forward. You look at where does the fault start? And so if there was a giant sinkhole in, in the road that happened you know, 300 milliseconds before the, the truck got there, then maybe the road designer is actually at fault for that. I don't know, we'll find out. If the you know, vehicle catches on fire and blows up, well, maybe the vehicle manufacturer is at fault. Uh, if the technology malfunctions and gets into collisions, then the technology manufacturer is at fault. Um, if the driver fails to do something that they should be doing, then the driver's at fault. So there's, there's ways of doing that. At the end of the day, we're going to figure out on a case-by-case -case through litigation like who actually was at fault for this specific incident. But I just think of it as it's more of a, we have a system in place today. It works fairly well. And uh, it's now we have actually more data, so we're going to be able to look more clearly at what actually happened and who was actually at fault. So, but you know, in the future, I, I would expect you to imagine more of the insurance moving on on the product liability side from the operational side because as the vehicle is expected to drive without a person, then the system is the driver and therefore all of the regular driver liabilities would move to whoever is doing the driving or the company is doing driving. Uh, what impact do you think this is going to have on the driver shortage? Uh, it's a major issue out there. I, I get a lot of feedback. This is great. It's going to bring a whole bunch of drivers at the same time. It's going to drive all the drivers out. I'll add into that. It's going to erode the skills of drivers so that safety may help, but then when they have to take control, it, their skills are going to be eroded. So uh, how would you tackle those things in terms of how it's going to impact the, the driver shortage and, and also the safety skills, the, the operating skills of drivers? I'll, I'll, I'll take a shot at that first. Uh, we don't know. Um, at the moment, and I have an autonomous uh, endorsement on my CDL. I drove the, uh, the Freightliner Inspiration truck here uh, in, in Nevada, and I have uh, sat in the driver's seat with my hand hovering over the steering wheel, uh, getting ready to grab it, and uh, never had to grab it. 
sort of one of the things that we're, we're wrestling with as a society. The, back to the first question, the, re, the reason there's so much discussion and interest in this, it's like a, peeling back the layers on an onion when you start thinking about, well, you know, someone's going to have to program vehicle ethics and what's going to happen to drivers and what's going to happen to technicians and, you know. So my, my thought is, depending on how quickly our comfort levels come up and uh, when we determine how engaged a human, we're gonna, there are going to be humans in the driver's seat for a very long time. We're not going to make a, a quick jump, in my opinion, to full automation uh, anytime soon. So we all know that driving a truck is a tough job. Um, the public hates you. You're away from home for long periods of time. So, you know, we, we're very soon going to be asking ourselves questions like, is it okay for a guy uh, to put the truck in full autonomous mode and Skype into a PTA meeting uh, or check, on, check with his wife or, uh, you know, shop on Amazon or play a video game if they're a millennial? We don't know the answer to these questions yet, but very soon these are the kind of things we're going to be talking about. And where I'm going with this is truck driving is a tough job, even if it's automated or unautomated, as long as we're requiring dri drivers to be in the seat, those guys are away from home, they're away from their loved ones. So to me, sort of the first question is, can we use this technology to sort of ease that uh, time of separation in among the many other ways automation can make the driver's lives easier? Yeah, uh, maybe I'll add to that for the specific case of platooning and then a little bit on automation. So uh, even platooning where we've got a driver there, they're steering, they're engaged, uh, it can help in, in certain ways with the driver shortage. Uh, we look at it, uh, you know, similar to a lot of you are, are now or have been adopting AMTs. Um, and with it, what we hear from many of you is that with AMTs, you can put a new driver, you know, who, who might not be as highly skilled uh, and myself being a novice truck driver, I, I know it is a challenge to shift, um, and I'm not as fuel efficient as, I, as an experienced driver would be. You put me in with an AMT, uh, most fleets tell us, you know, it kind of gets up to like the 80th percentile, you know, not quite their best, as good fuel economy as their best driver, but, but pretty close. Um, same thing as you think about uh, collision mitigation and platooning. You can put a new driver in there, um, get the same level of safety and efficiency uh, that you would have, or very close to the same level as you would have with a more experienced driver. Um, so that can help immediately with the driver shortage, uh, where you can you can put new you know new drivers in with the same confidence you would have putting a more experienced driver in. Uh, you can uh, you may be paying them less uh, with less experience as well. Uh, certainly, as you move to automation, uh, that's where where the big help is on driver shortage, right? If you extend their hours of service and so on, that's that's a clear a clear win. Um, how, how are you guys, we, we talked about Nevada, how are you guys communicating with the FMCSA or uh, other, other federal officials as you move uh, forward uh, in compared with uh, sort of what we laid out with Nevada? I mean, we, you know, we certainly engage with uh, FMCSA and with uh, NHTSA just to make sure they're aware, you know, they're very interested in understanding our technology, understanding how it works, um, so we're definitely engaged with them. Um, on a regular basis to make sure they understand the technology. Um, obviously, at some point, you know, they'll come out with rules um, and regulate uh, um, the, the technology, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, because um, eventually, you know, right now we have sort of this patchwork of state legislation, um, at least as with respect to platooning and um, with respect to autonomous legislation as well. So eventually, we'll need national standards if this technology is going to be deployed. Um, and so it's important that we keep them up to date on, on, on what we're doing. Um, you know, NHTSA recently just came out with a guidance document, pretty comprehensive. Uh, we're still in the process of reviewing it, but it seems like a good start to a conversation as to, you know, what the future of regulations might look like. Yeah, Anthony? I would disagree that we need uh, national regulations in order to roll out. I feel like the example that's always given is like, oh, when, a, you know, a, a vehicle is driving across state boundaries, like how does it know to change the software? Well, it knows how to do that on many other things. It knows how to do time zone changes on your GPS when you're going from one time zone to the next. It's not really a difficult thing for the software to be like, oh, the speed limit is not 55 anymore, now it's 65. Um, so there's, there's, there's things like that that are easy. I think um, you know, overall, this technology is going to make uh, driving a truck a lot easier, uh, specifically if you're an owner operator and you have a, a kit on your, on your truck that allows it to drive 24-7 you're going to have a lot more uh, return on investment for that, so that's really interesting there. And you know, just like Uber's basic business, um, you know, it was interesting because we both added 
drivers, you know, as um, you know, driver partners uh, on the system as well as new customers. I think the same thing is going to happen in trucking, where we're going to add capacity on the carrier side by bringing new technology that's going to allow the trucks to be more productive. Not that should be like a third of the time, but you know, ideally 24/7. And then at the same time, you brought on extra demand, and so by having uh, a more efficient way of matching uh, um, freight and carriers, we're going to be able to you know, boost the demand for this. So I, th I see the industry growing much more to kind of answer your previous question. So driver shortage is probably going to be still a real thing for the next couple of years, but I imagine long down the road that like none of the new trucks will have a cab on them. It just doesn't make sense many years from now to have that. So your, your view is that driverless one day is where this is heading? Yeah, I mean, like when you when you're calling a truck, you say you say driverless truck, you know, and like at some point it will switch uh, from being like, oh, this is a manual truck, and not manual in terms of the transmission, but manual in terms of like you need an actual driver to, to drive it. Just like we go to movies and we call them movies, you know, at some point it was uh, silent film and talkies, and you know now the movies became the actual, you know, we dropped the talkies name because it became the actual. Uh, general thing. So, I don't know, I think it's just a question of how long does the transition take? Does it take 20 years? Does mm. it take 30 years? Um, you know, we're pushing to make that as soon as possible. And we'll Driverless? Is that, is that where this is going? So, yeah. well, uh, just before that, I want to, to your question yes. about the Fed, you know, the federal regulators and how, how to get them involved. And just very briefly, they've been very proactive in funding research projects. Of course, we have the super truck here and there were the other super trucks but also they funded a few platooning research projects um, with some of, the, some of the players in the room. So one was with Volvo uh, uh, and Bendix. One was with um, Peterbilt and Meritor Wabco. Uh, they recently funded the Smart Cities Challenge, which mm. Columbus, um, uh, Columbus won. And there's, uh, uh, there's some uh, platooning uh, and other automation, of course, significant automation activity. Um, in that, but but especially um, or notably, there is trucking involved in that. So I think the way to to keep them involved is just to to interact, you know, with FMCSA and it's a um, and Federal Highways, uh, you know, keep them keep them in the loop. So there's no surprises for them, uh, and then you know they're very supportive as long as they're they're in the loop. Do you have any reactions to these NHTSA autonomous guidelines that that were recently released? I mentioned uh, these these good. I've heard it mentioned that maybe trucking was not included enough, and and that's a problem, and 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 it sort of got off maybe on the wrong foot, and and is sending the wrong signal. Do uh, you have any reaction to the guidelines released and, and how it, it maybe more it needs to be more inclusive of trucking moving forward in order to make this happen? I think it's good that it was that something is put down on paper. You know, it's sort of, we've had conversations with NHTSA about the autonomous technology, and 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 so I mean I think there's always an issue as to as whether you know uh, trucking ends up sort of uh, not by our own uh, uh, choice but following behind uh, um, with dealing with NHTSA on regulations. You know, rules typically come out for the car industry first, and then uh, they try and apply those same type of regulations to trucks, and obviously trucks are a very different product. Um, but I do think it's good that we actually, now we have something hard and firm, we know exactly where NHTSA stands today, and they say it's gonna be, a, it's gonna be an evolving document, but once it's on paper, that lets us actually sort of tweak the words here and there, and try and you know, help understand exactly what everyone's meaning on both sides of the discussion. So uh, I think it'll actually, it'll, much like these kind of conversations, it's gonna be a good step forward for us to have better conversations with NHTSA. Um, do you have any thoughts on, on how that could affect uh, in terms of the state level? Yeah, um, Nevada has been very much involved in the um, model state policy that NHTSA had come out with last week. Uh, Nevada is the vice chair on the American um, Association of Motor Vehicle Examiners um, Autonomous Working Group. Um, California is the chair of it, and we have been tasked by NHTSA for the last two years to create a document that would actually be provided to the jurisdictions that are considering legal uh, as well as uh, regulatory uh, autonomous laws and so forth. Um, well, when the model state policy came out last week or so ago, um, it was encouraging. Nevada has always said from 2011, even though we had to create uh, consumer deployment regulations, we always felt that in order for this to really be a success nationwide, we needed the consumer deployment regulations to be off of the state's shoulders. 
And we, we will continue to say that even though the document is uh, encouraging that NHTSA is looking at that, of uh, whether they're going to uh, remain with the self-certification process they have today with auto dealers, or if they're going to and or improve in that self-certification process, expand their uh, federal motor vehicle safety standards, mm. or a combination of those things, our hope was and it, that they actually have made that decision prior to technology being deployed to the consumers. That has been Nevada's statement from 2011 and will continue to be. I agree with uh, the uh, delegates on the panel. It's, in, it's encouraging. It's, it's based on discussions we've had in the last five years. But ours is about timing. We do not want consumers just to have, have this technology in their hands before something is regulated on the national level. And the reason why we want that is because we don't want 50 different states out there creating 50 different regulations for consumer deployment. And that's not the way to do that. And actually, in our opinion, in Nevada, it stifles industry. It's not the direction to go. Uh, so we are pushed to continue to say we need to, whether NHTSA needs expanded uh, authority under Congress to make that decision, or if they have the existing authority under their rules right now to make that decision, it's our hope that they start to consider that because it's really about timing. We, we've got to have the cart before, or the horse before the cart instead of the cart before the horse. What, what about the costs of the technology of the systems being developed? The return on investment is, is an obviously uh, important factor for everyone in the audience. Trucks are fairly expensive these days as it is. Uh, can, you, can you speak to uh, where we're going in terms of costs and, and thoughts about return on investment? Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll start uh, with platooning. So uh, we, you know, we recognize that there's a new technology for fleets. So we've, we've, um, our sort of pricing model, and I'm not here to sell the system, but our pricing model is to sell the, the hardware at cost. So we don't make any money off the hardware, and then we sell platooning as a service to you. Um, so what that means is if you don't end up platooning as much as we think you'll platoon, you're only going to pay for what you actually use. Um, and this has proven popular with you know, man, many of you in the audience and, and, uh, and, and your colleagues. Um, and this allows very rapid payback, so un, under a year payback uh, for the platooning system. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's, of course, what, what you all want. Um, and the beauty of this is because it's built on the systems you're already buying, uh, there's not a lot of hardware we have to add for platooning. Higher levels of automation will provide more value and, and require more hardware and more cost. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll leave the others to answer for, for that. Yeah, you know, you know many of the uh, enablers for autonomous technology are already in place on the truck, Detroit Assurance and, uh, you know, um, uh, you know uh, lane uh, warnings. And um, so, you know, right now all we have, we have, we have prototypes, we have three licensed autonomous trucks. Um, you know, we don't know what the cost is ultimately going to be. There's a huge difference between building three trucks and going to full production. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's substantially different in terms of the testing and the data and the miles you've got to put on those vehicles to make sure that they're safe. Ultimately, at the end of the day, if the product doesn't provide a return on investment for our customers, uh, it won't work, it won't succeed. So I don't know what the price is, but uh, certainly that technology would never be deployed unless it's going to uh, have a positive uh, ROI. Yeah, so I would say the same thing. I mean, all new technology is super expensive. Uh, this is no difference to that. Uh, but also, as technology matures and gets more manufacturable, the price always inevitably drops as long as there's you know, value that's being created. And so I think this is the same thing for this technology. In fact, our goal is really to be able to provide the technology uh, at a super low cost and have that system help bring the automation and liquidity to the future of transportation. So, um, we might even give it away to some of our, uh, to all the, the partners that we have on uh, Uber Freight in order to stimulate and build the liquidity in the marketplace that we want to uh, build. Last question, we're, we're run out of time, uh, so, so fairly quickly. State of infrastructure funding, uh, uh, the roads are deteriorating at the same time. Uh, you need to fix those and you probably need a lot of the V to V and reading the signs and the you know, the, to understand what's going on, the connected vehicles, all the, how, how at the same time when we're trying to find out how to fix the roads and bridges we have, 
also get some of the funding uh, might, that might be needed to really get all this deployed so all the vehicles can talk to each other and, and all of this that we're beginning to talk about could one day become a reality. I, How does that happen? I, I think that's the missing piece of the puzzle right now. I've heard different versions as to how much uh, communication infrastructure between vehicles we actually need. I'm sure, Anthony, you would say we could pretty much do autonomous now if we really wanted to. Um, here's, here's what I tell people when I speak to industry groups is we, we right now, uh, we don't have our highway system up to 1950 standards when President Eisenhower built them. And I like to point out that the Chinese are building a superhighway network from scratch, so they're obviously building it to 21st century standards. This is a vital part of our economy. This is how we're going to compete in a global super economy powered by the, by the internet. Um, you know, to me, this is something we need to find the will for. And my argument would be this would be a massive, massive jobs construction project on par with building the interstates uh, the first time we did it. And so I think that's some of the argument we should use. You know, this, we're talking about jobs a lot these days, obviously, for obvious reasons. Well, here's a really good way to uh, get some infrastructure going, modernize our, our, our logistical network, and stay competitive globally. Anyone else? Yeah, you know, uh, three billion gallons of fuel are wasted every year in congestion. It's a huge cost to our society, um, and it's something that we absolutely have to spend money on and tackle. Uh, with respect to the autonomous system, you know, we have to design trucks that operate in the, in, in the world in which we live, which is, with the, the, which is in the, with the current state of infrastructure. So the Inspiration truck, for example, uh, you know, as it, reads the, as it reads the lane markings, when those lane markings disappear, which happens in, in different parts all over the country, the, the truck tells you to take back control of the vehicle, and if you don't take control of the vehicle, it'll shut itself down and pull off to the side of the road. So we, you know, it's a, uh, it's a huge problem we have to tackle, we need to tackle. There's huge benefits for everyone if we can uh, uh, put some effort into it. Um, and, and frankly, sell it's not. a lot of trucks, wouldn't you? If you we'd, we'd sell, yeah, and it's, uh, frankly, it requires Congressional con Congress to act. So um, we would ask them to do so. So I would say, um, you know, like all budgets, we should be frugal with the tax dollars that went into the system. Um, and instead of, you know, we don't think we need to add V2V across the nation's highway. That seems like a lot of extra expense. But just painting the roads and making sure the lane markings are correctly painted uh, would be a huge savings. But also, if you think about um, looking forward, if you do have self-driving trucks, then you can look at um, reducing the size of the vehicles or reducing the weights that the vehicles have per axle. And that tremendously impacts the damage uh, to the road, uh, which grows by the fourth power of the weight on the axle. So if you think about it, if you take a truck and you split into two trucks that are half the weight, uh, you sell more trucks. And we have no intentions of manufacturing any <laughs> hardware. I just didn't want to be clear about that. Um, and so you can split into two trucks. You do basically one-eighth the damage. So you should potentially pay one-eighth the actual cost of repairing the roads if your trucks are there. Now, it doesn't make sense today because the, the cost of the driver is actually a very huge dominant fact. Uh, or cost of, of operating a fleet, but once you have automation, that cost kind of goes away, and so all of these you know, more efficient ways of using our roads becomes uh, valuable. All right, uh, the clock is telling me I, I absolutely need to wrap this up here. Uh, I wish we could have gotten to even more. I want to first thank the panelists. Uh, I also want to thank Freightliner and Omnitrax for their sponsorship and everyone for spending the time with us this morning. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the conference, has one more chance through the exhibit hall, enjoys the banquet tonight, and thank you for joining us. Some nights I wish that my lips could build a castle. Some nights I wish they just fall off. But I still.